how soon could Binance's assets be placed into receivership potentially? Tuesday. Some of these allegations in this complaint regarding the registration of exchanges, broker dealer and clearinghouse activities, they can be pled against virtually every crypto exchange that US customers have access to. You could wake up tomorrow and there could be suits against any major exchange. The Bitcoin Layer is brought to you by Envoy. Envoy is an easy to use Bitcoin mobile wallet that you can download and set up for free on the App Store and Google Play today. Stay tuned to the video to learn more. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. Today, I am joined by none other than Joe Carlosari. He is a partner at Amundsen Davis here today to talk to us as a legal expert about all of the happenings going on this week in the crypto space with Binance, Coinbase, and, and what's next. Joe, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me on, Joe. I could not be more excited about this episode. We teased this months ago, and uh, now we're here with complaints, with TROs that have been filed, with uh, litigation that's going to ramp up, and I think more litigation that's going to come uh, in the next month uh, based on things I've heard on background. So uh, exciting episode. Let's dig in. We did. Let's dig, let's dig right in. You called it on our last episode. You said Coinbase was the one to look out for. And in a, you know, a two-parter, we don't see this very often. I mean, movies are shown one at a time. There's no such thing as a double feature anymore. But in a double feature from the SEC, we got two lawsuits back to back on two separate days. So I'll leave the floor to you. Uh, Binance is facing 13 charges. Coinbase sued the following day for five charges. What on earth is happening? So uh, we've got you know, just massive complaints, right? Let's start with the Binance uh, complaint we got. 136 pages, a whole host of accounts uh, and different cl claims and different uh, issues that are referenced. We've already got a TRO that's being filed, which I'll explain. I'm just going to give you a brief overview. So effectively, the, the allegations against Binance are threefold. And it's similar in many ways to the allegations against Coinbase with a uh, significant difference. The primary difference between the two is this allegation regarding the commingling of funds. Uh, there's no such allegation regarding the commingling of funds in the Coinbase suit. Um, basically, the allegation in the Binance suit is that there's this entity, Binance US, okay, that is really uh, there's no there's no real uh, wall between that and the international, and that there are many uh, examples that they cite where there is money flowing back and forth from believed accounts that belong to the international and, and accounts that belong to the US, and and that there is uh, some suggestion that the US exchange couldn't make a move without CZ's blessing. Um, so that's that's the main distinction between the two. Uh, we'll see if there are more that develop in the litigation. But aside from that, the overall Binance complaint has really three sections. It has, number one, these allegations that you failed to register as broker-dealer, as a clearinghouse, as an, un, uh, as an exchange. Uh, the SEC put up on their Twitter handle this really fun sort of uh, photo that said, it was a quote, I guess, from an internal chat message that they uncovered um, through uh, their pre-suit discovery. Uh, where they basically said we're operating an effing unregistered exchange. Someone who, uh, from Binance making that exact uh, remark. Not a good thing if you're involved in litigation. In fact, CZ himself said it was embarrassing and he sent out this note to uh, Binance staff uh, that has now also become public saying you should not be writing anything in, in chats and, and message logs unless you expect it to be you know, uh, subject to discovery. Um, so that's the, the first element is this. You're operating just on its face, an unregistered, unlawful exchange, unregistered broker-dealer, unregistered clearinghouse. The second relates to the BUSD token and some of the representations that that offering itself is, in fact, an investment contract that you know they're effectively using this token uh, and, and issuing it directly to U.S.-based customers uh, with an expectation of profit. That's a, that's a whole other separate uh, aspect of the complaint. And then they've got this broader section where specific tokens in themselves can in fact be uh, investment contracts. So that's um, you know the three major sections. Coinbase is a similar issue. Like again, the main difference between the two is at this point there's no allegation of commingling of funds uh, with the Coinbase. However, Coinbase is facing the same allegation. You're operating an unregistered broker dealer, unregistered clearinghouse, unregistered exchange in itself. That is a, an existential threat to Coinbase. 
They're also being accused of specific tokens, aiding and abetting the sale of specific tokens that qualify as investment contracts per the eyes of the SEC. And then finally, um, they have an issue with Coinbase's EARN program and the representations associated with that, if that itself is in fact an investment uh, contract. So before we dig into the specifics in some of those, I just want to uh, focus people's attention on the key legal developments and the distinction from what's happening in the Coinbase case with the Binance case uh, with the temporary restraining order. So when you get a complaint, just basic civil procedure, it tends to be a slow moving process at the beginning. You, you file the complaint, you serve the other side, you wait for the other side to appear. They have attorneys that will appear. There's motion practice. And the whole process gets, like I said, pretty slow moving at the get go. Um, you know, it can take months sometimes before the defendant will even appear and answer the complaint. But in this circumstance, the SEC has sought an extraordinary remedy under the law. They have uh, sought an, a temporary restraining order. Temporary restraining orders are rarely granted. It's an extremely high burden. Um, the SEC uh, filed it when they filed the original complaint, and then they filed the actual, uh, they filed a reference to it, and then they filed the actual 73-page uh, temporary restraining order uh, petition with supporting documents, declarations. Uh, the forensic accountant has, has supplemented it with sort of her breakdown of where the assets are and anticipated profits. And, and what the, uh, the SEC is doing is they're going to they're gonna be in court on Tuesday uh, arguing this temporary restraining order saying you need to freeze Binance's assets, Binance US, you need a full accounting, a receiver should be appointed, we need to do discovery because if they have commingled funds and funds are moving back and forth, between uh, you know the domestic entity and the international entity, there's a risk of capital flight that will cause irreparable harm. Uh, judges very rarely want to grant TROs. Yeah, it's an extremely high burden. Again, you have to prove irreparable harm, which is basically saying that monetary damages later can't compensate you for the loss. And you have to prove preliminarily a likelihood of success in the merits, which is the far more interesting point. Um, we'll get into that in a moment. But Likelihood of success in, on the merits is effectively that the judge has to make a preliminary finding as early as next week that the SEC is likely to succeed on the cause of action they've brought. Um, and if you're defending clients, I defend clients, uh, you don't want a preliminary finding part of the record that you're already likely to lose. Um, so I'll yield the floor right there for some questions. Fantastic. Joe, in that six minutes, I think not just myself, but also our viewers got got a lesson in uh, in law um, that uh, you know we, we didn't know that we could get in a six minute window. So I appreciate that. Um, first things first, I want to ask you. Um, I, I read you know with this temporary restraining order, Reuters put out a piece about it yesterday, and many other pundits have been talking about. It. I think Binance themselves even tweeted it that um, with this temporary restraining order, they're moving in advance of that and halting U.S. dollar deposits to their platform. And very soon, uh, next week, they may also be halting withdrawals. Um, can you add, add a little bit more color to that? Yeah, so that's an interest, that, that was an interesting development. Um, there's been some reporting that their banking partners um, have had pressure put on them and they were going to terminate it uh, on their own. Uh, I don't know how much truth that is. If that's just Binance spin, they're trying to curry up um, you know, public support behind them. Uh, you know, obviously th there's a reason why it, I tell you, you know, it, particularly as a litigator, this, it's pretty frustrating, right? Because you want uh, these issues to be resolved in a courtroom. You want it to be resolved in a judicial setting where a judge is entering orders. You don't want the SEC, if it is true, what Binance is saying, uh, to be exerting extra judicial pressure on banking partners to terminate their banking ties uh, preemptively before the court even rules. In my view, uh, with all due respect to the SEC, that's, that's inappropriate um, if that is true. I don't know if it's true or if it's just Binance's spin. Um, we'll see. But I think what, what the, the, the genesis behind Binance's decision on this is, according to them, their banking partners were facing pressure uh, from regulators to sever ties. So I guess they wanted to get out in front of it. They didn't want it to be done. Uh, you know, it's, if you know something's going to happen for certain, it, it's better to sort of handle it and frame the message and start to prime the public for what's going to happen than just wake up tomorrow and the banking partners have severed the connection, people's money's trapped. So I think that's why they, they've elected to go this route, even before the SEC's uh, TRO has been fully heard and ruled upon by the court. Perfect. I have a question about SEC jurisdiction. In the case of FTX, of course, a much different case than this one. 
Um, I think FTX is far more similarities to Binance than Coinance, uh, Coinbase does to something like FTX. I mean, Binance is certainly, uh, I feel, a much more criminal uh, criminal charges being put against them than with Coinbase, particularly with commingling of uh, user funds. Um, does the SEC have jurisdiction in this case uh, because of the commingling of customer funds with Binance.us and the fact that also in the exchange, uh, also in the case, rather, it was noted that Binance knowingly allowed and even encouraged high net worth U.S. customers to use VPNs to use the Binance service. Is that why the U.S. has jurisdiction over not just Binance U.S., but they're charging Binance proper as well as CZ? Uh, no, the the U.S. has jurisdiction because of the fact that, as as alleged in their complaint, they claim that they were knowingly and willingly attempting to interact with U.S. customers to sell unregistered securities. Again, this is their allegation. Jurisdiction will be a fight at some point in this case. I don't expect it to just uh, not be an issue, but but that's the core of what what is being uh, alleged. That because you were knowingly interacting, um, and despite what they've said publicly, how they're trying to screen out, um, you know, U.S. customers, uh, they, they're saying effectively it doesn't it doesn't matter. Number one, because you commingled assets and you were using assets from the international with the U.S. based entity, but also because you knowingly promoted and sort of uh, solicited customers in the United States. So. Both of those would give a jurisdictional hook. If you're selling uh, unregistered securities to American citizens, uh, the SEC has jurisdiction. Phenomenal. Well put. I have a question. I want to talk about wash trading, and then we'll talk about um, we'll talk about some of the products that both both exchanges offered, um, some of the functions they were legally performing, and then what it, within the SEC document some of these classifications could mean in terms of you know, implications moving forward for crypto at large. In the Binance case, it was alleged that they were engaging in wash trading. Binance historically, they own Coin Market Cap. Um, obviously, the yes. most the most widely used website for viewing, you know, the volume of uh, of different coins. And um, seeing that a CZ controlled entity was engaged in wash trading leads me to believe that a lot of the volume, not just on Coin Market Cap, but that Binance has been advertising itself, could be fraudulent. Is what is alleged in the SEC uh, case? Does that have any legs behind it? Could you add a little bit more color there? Yes, and uh, you you said you read the TRO petition. I skimmed it. Okay. <laughs> well, let me just read you a section of it because I, I, this is one of the highlights that when I was going through it with a fine tooth comb, I, I spotted. Um, so, BAM Trading, you know, the U.S. based entity, it says that senior BAM Trading officers were on notice even before um, the platform's launch that wash trading was possible. They cite correspondence with an attachment, Exhibit A54. And it said this continued through at least 2022. In January 2021, BAM Trading Director of Institutional Sales informed BAM CEO A, who had departed the company uh, subsequent to this, apparently we have nothing in, in place to prevent wash trading. Just, te just tested it myself. Sold market order into my own bid. That is a quote. Just stunning, right? That's Exhibit A55. They're, they got this, uh, uh, this internal communication. He said that then he warned, not sure if this is being exploited at any level, the lower the fees for a market maker, the easier it might be to manipulate the market. Also another uh, uh, correspondence internally. Another BAM trading employee responded to this inquiry, yikes. Okay, definitely embarrassing, very embarrassing for Binance. Binance Trade lacked any surveillance mechanisms until at least February 2022, six months after BAM Trading and BAM Manager began approaching prospective equity investors with the pitch deck, more than three and a half years after Binance US platform launched and stated publicly that it prohibited fraudulent activity. But even after February 2022, BAM Management and BAM Trading failed to provide trade surveillance company A, so the, they're describing a company whose identity has been sanitized. Um, they failed to provide trade surveillance company A with account owner information that would make it able to detect trades between related accounts, thus preventing the company they hired, trade surveillance company A, from actually monitoring. So again, you know, this is this is the pattern that is, is emerging from this, that they're playing fast and loose. They're uh, perhaps willingly or uh, negligently failing to monitor their own accounts, that they're aware this has existed and they're doing nothing, right? So if you were a customer on that platform and you were a victim of this, I mean, that's you have legal remedies and the SEC uh, is able to enforce those remedies, but also you as a private citizen, now that you have this information that's in the public domain, 
you know that this is not how you run an exchange. This is an, an embarrassing uh, situation for Binance, particularly where their own words are going to be used to prosecute them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the wash trading is a massive issue. The, the commingling is a, a significant problem for them. Um, and, and putting aside all of that, okay, you, they've got, you know, these very embarrassing messages and, and l- lack of internal uh, surveillance and the wash trading issues. They still got the issues that Coinbase is facing, which is, you know, on a fundamental basis, the SEC is saying you can't operate these things without proper licensure from the SEC, without proper registration. And they didn't do it. So it, Coin, Coinbase, put it this way, Binance has all the problems Coinbase has and more. Fantastic. That's a great way of putting it. Uh, then let's let's talk briefly at a at a fundamental level what these two exchanges were engaging in that they simply were not allowed to um, on U.S. soil, right? Operating as uh, unlicensed exchanges, broker dealers, and clearing agencies, um, and within that, offering unlicensed securities as well. Um, uh, per the Howey test, like you said earlier, a security is an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others. So th- those are the four tenants. And um, not just the, the securities that are being offered in both platforms, but both staking services, those fit the bill almost entirely, right? These codified in the Securities Act of 1933 and the Exchange Act, I'm not sure when uh, it was it, it came out. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the tactic behind the way that Coinbase has defended itself outwardly and the way that Binance has defended itself outwardly is by saying, well, the laws don't exist for us. We need guidance. We need guidance on how to properly re- properly regulate ourselves. It sounds like a lot of the products that they're offering fall directly into these, you know, the legal code that was created centuries ago for these types of investment products. So let's talk about the three uh, things that they are charged with, um, you know, unlicensed exchange, unlicensed broker dealer, unlicensed agency, and whether or not the laws already exist um, for, for these crypto businesses to be operating. Well, this is one where it's not going to be um, pleasant for, I think, viewers trying to grapple with this because this is an open debate, okay? Um, there have been legal scholars, respected legal scholars on all sides of it as to whether the resale and secondary market of many of these tokens imposes the requirements to get registered as broker-dealers, as exchanges, as clearing houses. I will tell you the conservative viewpoint of the law is that it does, and that's the position the SEC has taken. And if you remember on the earlier episode we recorded um, a few months ago about uh, on the Bitcoin layer about you know what what is the most important thing about this suit? The most important thing about the suit, I think, is these claims, okay? These structural claims about what can you do without proper registration with the SEC. And what I said at the time, as I recall, is that, you know, the, the bullish version of these complaints would be, well, you're selling certain assets and these certain assets are, in fact, unregistered securities. So we want you to delist them and be disgorged of any profits from the sale. We also want you to stop doing the staking services, Okay. If that was all that was in this complaint, these two complaints, that would be fantastic, right? That would be a huge win for both of these entities because it's easy to comply. You just delist these specific assets, but your overall business as a whole is unimpacted, okay? That's not the position that it's taking. This is the broad version of it saying your your fundamental business activity falls within Section 15 of the Exchange Act, for example, with broker-dealers. You you cannot uh, you cannot act as a broker dealer without proper SEC registration, given the nature of what you're you're providing. Same thing with you know Section two three of the Exchange Act, the registration of exchanges. The requirement to register on its face is something that is necessary if you're dealing in these particular tokens, and the tokens themselves obviously are unregistered securities. Um, and even then, you know, you, the, there's a question. You know, how, how is it? How can you even provide this when the token uh, issuers themselves, in many cases, don't seek proper registration. In other words, put differently, there's not a real clear mechanism for them to even become compliant. And I want to talk about, you know, I want to piece together interesting things and offer you what I think is, I'll, 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 co- I'll give a caveat that it's my supposition. You take two separate actors, okay? You take Brian Armstrong. And Brian Armstrong has said repeatedly, we met with the SEC 30 plus times and we couldn't get guidance on how to become compliant. We did, we wanted a path to becoming compliant and they wouldn't give it to us. Then you take the statements of Chair Gensler publicly, where he has said repeatedly, we want these exchanges to come in, we want them to register and become compliant. How do you reconcile those two statements? I'll tell you my supposition. Again, this is my, I don't have any direct knowledge of this, but I 
I would guess the conversation went like that, like this. During those 30 odd meetings with the SEC and Coinbase, what they likely said is, look, you've been engaging in activity that we view as unlawful for years. And we're not going to bless it after the fact and grant you um, a path to becoming compliant right now uh, with the current construction of your exchanges. Okay, this isn't going to be something where you know you you have violated what the SEC perceives to be a law, and you're going to come in and beg for forgiveness, and that's going to be fine. Um, you should have asked for permission at the get go. Um, now, whether they would have given permission is a different story. But put all that aside. My view is the SEC likely told them, if you really want to become compliant, not face an enforcement action, you have to delist everything, nearly everything from your platform until it gets our stamp of approval. And obviously, if you're Coinbase and you're their counsel and you're hearing that, that's not acceptable, right? That's, that's, that means your business is dead. So obviously, you have no choice but to fight the issue in court. There's no resolution you could agree to uh, with the SEC. So, you know, that's the position they're taking. I think that there was hope um, maybe for some brokered uh, a deal between major exchanges and the SEC. I think I think there was also hope for legislation. Both of those sort of hopes have died on the vine. And now you're left in a situation where it's all out war. It's not just about specific tokens. It's not just about staking. This is about the very exchange activity itself and what is needed to operate as a quote unquote crypto exchange. Extremely well said, Joe. And that's that's something I noticed as well. Um, again, Coinbase's marketing mantra, even when they, they these you know it, this got filed on Tuesday, immediately within a few hours, they put out a, a flashly edited ad saying, we've asked the SEC for guidance 88 times and the SEC has provided new rules zero times but it seems to me like the business was constructed the assets were listed it became a publicly listed stock they became a multi-billion dollar company and then they sought regulation and they they to, to get into the regulatory window rather and they did that backwards right if they did it yeah. the other way around seems like chair Gensler would, would have played ball with them well the, yes and no okay and, and I'll just give you the the the, the more pro crypto version of this um, there have been companies that have gone to the SEC, I'm, pro I'm personally aware of, and they've tried to get guidance, they've tried to ask for, for approval, and in many respects, the SEC does not preemptively grant what, what's called a no action letter or grant them clearance. Um, it's very hard for them to sort of uh, get the response they want. So I'm not so sure that if they've done it in the, the way the SEC wants them to do it, they wouldn't just be sitting there waiting uh, perpetually for some answer uh, from the SEC to green light it. Uh, but, you know, again, that's the risk you take. I mean, Coinbase and many other exchanges hired lawyers way back when, when they're, when they're launching these tokens and when they're listing other assets. And I guarantee you, okay, without any direct knowledge of it, those lawyers said, look, there's a real risk out here that later on these things could be interpreted as uh, investment contracts. So you have to be aware of that. Um, you know, I've written some of those letters to clients in the past and, and, and it's difficult because you're telling a business that is getting up uh, and going and, and ready to take on the world and, and make billions of dollars, don't do it. And it's kind of like, well, you know, are you going to roll the dice and face the consequences? And I think Coinbase elected to roll the dice and now they have the consequences. It's, it's, I'm not saying it's a, it's, it's a entire, the SEC has no issue, no fault here. Okay. I think there is some fault on the SEC. Um, I think there's some a much more fault on Congress. Uh, but, you know, from my perspective here, when you take calculated risks for business purposes, you have to be prepared for the consequences. Extremely well said. It's the cost of doing business. Let's talk about then, um, I, I want to talk about momentarily what can be interpreted as an investment contract. We talk about the securities you were listing, but also um, I want to chat a little bit about um, the, the EARN programs that they had. Of course, Coinbase had its, uh, I believe it was called Coinbase EARN. Binance had a similar program, not on Binance US, but of course, now that we know in hindsight, they, they may have been the very same entity or at least controlled by it. Uh, both of these products or this suite of products that offered yield could be interpreted as an investment contract. Uh, apart from the securities they were listing, it seems like obviously offering yield based on the uh, generating a profit from others that sort of falls in line with the definition of a security. Um, I don't know if you can say that if these things were investment contracts, but I guess, uh, what, what would be your supposition there? Uh, so I'll just tell you, uh, without giving anybody any specific legal advice, I think that if you go to the core, if you, if another individual is 
staking your tokens for you or lending them out or doing something, doing some managerial or entrepreneurial activity, and they're advertising that you're going to partake in that, to me, that is a security. That's an investment contract. Um, you know, I, I understand arguments. There's always an argument, right? Um, and there are seldom cases uh, in, in the regulatory context where I think it's open and shut and there's no potential areas for distinction. That's why litigators like myself have a job. However, I would say that these types of programs are particularly problematic. And when you look at um, some of the case law in other contexts outside the digital asset, asset space, if you replace a token or an asset with um, some other more physical uh, uh, thing of value, the logic is almost identical. In those cases, those things have been found to be investment contracts. So you're just changing this instrumentality. You're just changing it to something in the digital context. And to me, that's a distinction without a difference. I don't think that should be particularly, uh, uh, I don't think that should particularly matter. And I think this is why, you know, you had issues with um, the resolve early on with good counsel that were able to uh, get the issue taken care of with like, for example, um, Kraken, right? You'll recall that Kraken back in February, uh, with respect to their staking as a service program, paid a $30 million fine, resolved the charge, and they avoided litigation on this issue. Um, that was a smart move, right? Because I think they would have ultimately spent a lot of money and ended up with a, a potentially worse uh, situation. And it gave the SEC what they wanted, which was a pound of flesh and they wanted uh, to hold up some victory that they successfully recovered $30 million. Um, whether that was right or wrong, you know, put it aside. But the law, I think, was on the side of the SEC in these issues with staking and, and earn-based programs. The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by Envoy. Envoy is an easy-to-use Bitcoin mobile wallet with powerful account management and privacy features. Take it from me, you guys. I set this thing up in 60 seconds, and you can too. You can set it up in 60 seconds, forget about it, and enjoy the zen-like experience of having your Bitcoin totally off exchanges. Not to mention, this thing backups your keys and encrypts them, so you don't have to worry about that either. You can Download it for free on Google Play and the App Store right now. How soon, given the um, given the TRO, um, given that Binance themselves are talking about it, Reuters are reporting out ahead of it, how soon um, could Binance's assets be placed into receivership potentially? Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's the answer. I mean, it, it's going to be presented on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. There's already been an extensive brief. There's declarations in support thereof. Um, and, oh, and actually what I will bring up if, if it's okay for a second is that, you know, some of the, the basis for a TRO. So, yeah. you know, for, for a TRO to be granted, okay, what you, what you effectively need in a lot of circumstances is you need some sort of, uh, threat of, you know, um, imminent disruption of the status quo, basically, you know, that if you don't act now, judge, you're going to permanently uh, call, you know, you're going to cause irreparable harm, which means some sort of permanent loss that won't be recovered after the fact through a monetary judgment. So with respect to the, the SEC, okay, what, what is the SEC's basis for why the court has to act now and why the court can't kick the can uh, down the road for some time? They say it's because of contradictions in uh, what has been said repeatedly by not only Binance is corporate representatives, but they're lawyers. Uh, they actually, in the TRO uh, petition, they cite statements uh, where the lawyers have been contradicted later and changed their story uh, versus what uh, officials have said from uh, Binance and uh, what the auditors have said. Uh, so, you know, there was an auditor who put together a report of Binance's finances and, the SC and Binance's lawyers later contradicted that report. That's definitely not a, a position you want to be in. I'm I was just looking up the, the citation here. Page 34 of the TRO, um, if you have it, it says, BAM Trading now disputes its own auditor's conclusion of past Binance custody of customer assets, claiming that, quote, the auditor did not undertake to determine whether wallet custody agreement actually governed how BAM Trading custody assets on behalf of its customers and was not based on a legal assessment of the facts of BAM Trading's custody practices. And they cite an exhibit, Exhibit A-68. Um, Such post hoc disputes that BAM trading may have had with an auditor that BAM trading itself retained to examine its own financial statements do little to reassure the SEC that customer assets are safely in the United States 
in the custody of persons within the jurisdiction of the court. So this is the theory. The theory is that like ultimately CZ and others close to him had had complete access to all their funds and still to this day have effect, effective de facto access to the accounts belonging to Binance US, which is US customers money. So if that's true, and you have an individual out there who has pu publicly stated, like our goal is to evade US jurisdiction. Our goal is to not have to be hauled into court uh, in the United States, which is what CZ has said, and that's cited by the SEC in the TRO, then federal court, you need to act now because we may lose this money and this could be FTX 2.0 if you don't freeze these accounts in order in accounting. So that's why it's an extraordinary remedy. Um, I will tell you, uh, it's a gamble. It's a big gamble for them to file it this early in the litigation. Um, like I said, TROs are, are seldom granted and it's a high bar, but the SEC must really think that they have enough concerns here to merit the court to intervene immediately. Could it be the case that because it is sort of uh, like you like you said, it's kind of a gamble to file it this early. Could it be because of all of the devastation wrought by exchanges like FTX and Celsius last year that they feel they've got the cannon fodder to file it this early and have it granted? Absolutely. Because here's the thing. Um, number one, I guarantee you it will be even if it's not legally relevant, it will be in the back of the judge's mind. If I don't freeze these assets, we could have FTX 2.0. Number two, from a political standpoint, if you're the SEC, even if you lose this this motion uh, for the TRO, even if you lose it, at least you can say, listen, we did everything we could. We went before a federal judge. We put it on her plate. We said, if you don't freeze these assets, we could potentially lose American customers' uh, assets on a going forward basis. These things could disappear overnight, given the nature of what cryptocurrency is and how hard it is to, uh, how easy it is to move it from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So you better act now, because the the risk of the flight of this capital is uh, is clear and present. And if the judge says no, and something blows up and Binance goes down and American customers have lost a lot of money, um, you know, the SEC is going to say, we did everything we could. We were in court on a TRO. We were doing uh, whatever was pop we were, were requesting, whatever relief the court would grant us, given the facts we had at the time to try to safeguard American deposits. And the, the SEC doesn't end up with egg on their face. And I think it, it is legitimate to say this TRO is probably, um, you know, in some respects, a response to the lack of uh, extreme, uh, uh, the lack of a significant request for some sort of injunction or some sort of freezing the assets in the FTX case, right? They took a lot of heat and a lot of criticism for not doing anything for that case and having all the assets disappear. So I think they're trying to act preemptively here and we'll see. We'll see if the judge uh, is, is, um, is willing to sort of uh, maybe enter an order that is going to impose uh, significant restrictions on Binance. The other thing that I think is, in, is significant too is that you also have in the background rumors about this DOJ investigation. Okay. So one of the things the SEC can do is if they are allowed to get in there and get an accounting and freeze assets, and they can prove that assets have been commingled between the international and the domestic, well, then the judge will grant uh, the, the US-based SEC to look at all of the records, including the records for the international. Let me explain why. Because if you're trying to figure out, uh, are, is this entity solvent? What was going on with the money? Where did it flow? Um, if you're trying to do that, and there's proof that this money is moving back and forth between accounts, and, and it's all commingled, then you've opened the door in terms of relevancy to everything in the Binance operation. The entirety of the Binance operation would be relevant. It may not only be relevant to figure out where the US assets are, but you still have to turn over the re those records. And if there is a full turnover of all records, and it's discovered there's criminal conduct as alleged in the CFTC complaint, there can be a subsequent referral of that information to the DOJ for criminal prosecution. Binance being hauled into federal court, extremely, uh, extremely dangerous stuff. I, you know, I, FTX, they didn't, they didn't act in time to sort of make them an example. I have a feeling that now they are, they learned their lesson. I have a feeling that um, Binance is certainly going to be made an example of. And I think the, the warning of uh, your, your single word answer to when could Binance's assets be placed in receivership Tuesday, I think that should really echo that should echo in the room of anybody that may still have funds. Of course, not not financial advice, not inciting anything, but certainly something to consider um, if you do have any funds on on any exchange, for that matter. I mean, right now, um, with uh, with everything going on, it, it would not surprise me that um, 
that uh, we, we start to see more action against other entities uh, w- with what's going on right now. I think it, it comes down to striking while the, while the iron is hot. I have, I have a couple of questions about um, Coinbase's business model. But uh, uh, Coinbase- Before we get in, can I just say that, yeah. you know, these allega- some of these allegations in this complaint regarding the registration of, of exchanges, broker dealer and clearinghouse activities, um, they can be pled against virtually every crypto exchange that U.S. customers have access to. So just be aware of that. Like you could wake up tomorrow and there could be suits against any major exchange. I know I saw a news report, I think today that Robinhood is delisting certain tokens. I think that's smart. Um, you know, it, just be aware. This is not isolated to just these two entities. So sorry to interrupt you there. No, not at all. Um, it's it's extremely important information. It can be applied to to several different exchanges. Oh my goodness. Okay. So then I guess my next question would be like, if that's the case, um, can Binance and Coinbase survive on a less bloated business model? They have built their name over the last several years um, on a slew of other assets, on fees that they garner from those other assets and traffic that they get and the volume that they can get from that. Um, and, uh, and also these earn programs. Uh, if they no longer are allowed to, if they can even remain in business after all of these uh, these legal battles, if they are allowed to remain open, can they even survive on these far less bloated business models? Uh, that's more of a business question. I'm very skeptical given what I've read publicly about you know their margins, but uh, we'll see. I mean, I, I will say this, okay? It's fascinating because we're going into what I think many perceive in the Bitcoin space, right or wrong. I think the overall consensus is that you're heading into more of a bull cycle or emerging from a bear cycle, however you want to put it. Um, and one of the fascinating things for me is that I think you're, there's no way these cases are going to resolve in the near term, right? They will, they will be cases for months and months uh, at a minimum. Uh, well into 2024, it would be my best guess. Um, but what I will say is, you know, what what kind of reaction is it going to have from the public that you've got these cases, uh, you know, pending? I have had many uh, normie friends, right, that are not into into cryptocurrency or into Bitcoin generally. Um, they have already shot me this opinion, say this is it, crypto's dead, right? And and I wonder, you know, among the general public, okay, which gets sucked in, uh, particularly into the altcoin space during the bull markets. I wonder whether these suits, the mere filing of them, will have a chilling effect and say, you know, well, wait a second, why am I going to put money in Coinbase when it's under active litigation with the SEC? And you and I may think about that issue differently, and people in crypto that are comfortable with taking a lot of risk might think about that differently. But newcomers to the space that always come and join with every bull market, I'm guessing, and this is just my guess, that they're going to be a little bit more reluctant when there's these suits out there and it's reported time and time again as the litigation goes on uh, that, you know, they're under, they're being sued by the federal government. Uh, how are you going to put your money there? Um, I, my guess is that people are going to be uh, less willing to, 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 you know, deposit their, their hard earned cash there. For sure. Extremely deleterious for, uh, for Bitcoin liquidity, right? Um, the, you know, the number one and number two exchanges um, now embroiled in these lawsuits and, and, public public perception you know if it's bad it can spread like wildfire um and uh, you know we saw that we, we've seen we saw that with with banks earlier this year and now we we may very well see it with these exchanges and unfortunately you know the billion dollar marketing budgets over the last decade have worked they have successfully conflated bitcoin with crypto and so while you and i you know may may go out bid up bitcoin put some more on our hardware wallet um the investing public certainly will not do that um and i think that leads into my next question uh, about across both cases Several cryptocurrencies were listed as unlicensed securities. Um, <laughs> of course, way too many, uh, way too many truncated acronyms for me. But Sol, Ada, Matic, Phil, Sand, and a slew of other ones—they um, were all uh, listed as unregistered securities, both across Binance and Coinbase, that were unlawfully sold uh, sold by the two. What are the implications of classifying um, these as securities? On, of course, on on. You know that we won't talk about necessarily about the businesses of, of Coinbase and Binance, but what are the implications of this from a legal perspective moving forward for the asset class? Well, if you get rulings from the court, and again, as I, I think I described it earlier, you have not just a case within a case or a couple of cases within a, in a case, you have uh, you know well over a dozen cases within the Coinbase suit, for example, with all these tokens and the issues with respect to their registration and the issues with respect to their own program. You've got all these little mini issues, okay? You could theoretically split this suit up into like 12 suits um, if the SEC wanted to plead it that way. 
um, they've played it all together. So, you know, we'll see, you know, how much discovery is done on the individual tokens that are named because ultimately the SEC is trying to get a ruling on these particular assets. And if there is a ruling, okay, and there's a finding that, yeah, this is an unregistered security, that will be cited by whole classes of different other litigants that aren't even involved in this case, right? You will have private actors that have purchased these tokens potentially file suits against the issuers. You'll have private actors file suits against the exchanges, citing the SEC and the SEC's position and a subsequent court order. And uh, under the law, when you have these decisions made, and then you go in front of another judge and say, well, judge, you can't have a different opinion because this case has already resolved the issue. Now, there's, there's doctrines in the law called uh, collateral estoppel res judicata. We're not gonna get into all of it, but basically what it means is the issue is solved. Right, it was resolved in this case. Therefore, in a subsequent case, it cannot be revisited and undone. That would that would cause uh, disparate rulings and a whole mess under the law. So the law would give credence on issues that have been resolved previously uh, to to stand for other cases. So you've got a whole lot of litigation that I think is waiting, looking at this and saying, okay, if you do find these in favor of the if the SEC wins these cases and and it's uh, and there's findings of fact that it support future litigation. That's problematic for a lot of people. I mean, ADA is one of the tokens listed, right? And uh, there are individuals to this day that are still very closely involved with uh, with ADA. Um, so we'll see, you know, how that spurs additional litigation. Just to give you one example. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stakes at play. There's a lot of cases that will be filed based on how this is resolved. Um, and it may give us precedent that's good. It may give us some precedent that's bad and, and a mixed bag. Um, we really got to wait and see. But, you know, from my perspective, the, the key thing that I think is going to be most interesting is when you get this order on the TRO to see the judge's analysis with respect to these requirements to register as an exchange. That will be spelled out and the judge will already give you some, uh, you'll be able to read the tea leaves as to where uh, she's leaning. Fantastic. I have a question regarding Ethereum, uh, explicitly named in the Coinbase case as um, one of the one of the many securities um, that, uh, not securities rather, but one of the many crypto asset securities, which is the the name that was used across both Binance and Coinbase to refer to these assets, the, both suits, um, that was named as one of the crypto asset securities that could be staked on, uh, on Coinbase specifically. Um, it says uh, Coinbase is violated and continues to violate sections 5A and 5C of the Securities Act by engaging in the unregistered offer and sale and securities in connection with its staking program, what we talked about earlier. Um, and it says Coinbase uses the offering proceeds and the risks and trends that affect the enterprise and an investment in these securities. And it uses the word securities. And then it goes on to name Ethereum among the many crypto asset securities that the staking program enables investors uh, to stake. Um, what are the implications for this? I know that this, uh, I think this was something you called very explicitly in the last episode we spoke about and the implications of a Coinbase lawsuit and crypto being uh, referred to as a security. What does this all mean? Yeah, so again, this is this is where you have to really be specific about whether it's the thing itself that is an investment contract or whether the activity related to the thing is an investment contract. Okay, and it's a big big distinction. Let me just give you one you might be familiar with, which is, you know, the the BlockFi programs. Now, block, Bitcoin is no. I haven't heard a serious argument uh, for why Bitcoin should be considered to be an investment contract. I think there uh, that that issue is sort of resolved even in the minds of the SEC. Um, so, with Bitcoin, which is not a security, if I were to lend, you know, BlockFi my Bitcoin, and then they would go lend it out to other folks, uh, and then they would pay be paid a yield for that lending service and then give me a portion of that yield. All of the activities being done by BlockFi. BlockFi is the one who's managing the money. They're assessing the credit risk. They're giving, getting a percentage of the yield and they're giving it to me. Uh, that is, in my mind, an investment contract. Even though the underlying instrumentality, the thing itself, Bitcoin is not an investment contract. So the way I read this Coinbase complaint, they have not gone so far as to say Ethereum itself is a security, is an investment contract. However, they're saying that the activity of giving Ethereum to Coinbase and it being used for staking purposes, that that is an investment contract. So um, that's an important distinction. It's important to, uh, not, to, to not conflate that with saying they're, they're claiming Ethereum itself is a security. However, uh, it's conspicuously absent from the Coinbase suits, uh, that the SEC suit against Coinbase, that they're saying Ethereum itself is an unregistered security. 
that allegation is not there. Uh, you have to wonder why. Um, it may be just because they didn't want to bite off more than they could chew. There's so much in this suit already. And if they were to take the position that Ethereum itself is is a, a investment contract, that would be, I mean, you'd have every everyone in the entire space lining up to file a support amicus for, for Coinbase. Um, so maybe they strategically said, we don't want to bite on that yet. Um, now, whether that preempts or prevents um, some sort of secondary suit against Ethereum founders, the foundation, uh, my view is it does not. However, they have not uh, bitten off that yet. We'll see. We'll see if things change. But you know, if they're if they're getting close to the staking activity as being something that falls within a securities analysis, man, you have to sort of wonder at one point are they going to go a little bit go to the next logical step, of saying, okay, well, obviously Coinbase can't stake on your behalf, but is staking itself on chain natively on your own? Is that enough? My guess is, you know, this is just my my view, uh, again, my supposition. I think that they they believe that if they cut off the liquidity to the exchanges in the United States, that will be sufficient to really uh, crush the industry. I think if they can f f call, and I've said this for, for years, I mean, if they really wanted to go for the jugular, they would go after the exchanges because that's how people get into the space. Yes, there are DEXs, right? But some of the data we have publicly is that you know, the folks that, that interact with the DEXs, they start somewhere, they have to get their fiat onto an exchange, and then they withdraw the, their, their Ethereum or whatever token they're, they're withdrawing. And that's how it gets to the DEXs. So if you, if you choke off that entry point, are the DEXs really going to be that big of an issue? You know? Yeah, it's all about the on ramps. Um, and, you know, again, yeah, you you really called it, you hit the nail on the head. Um, ages ago, you've said it several times, uh, you know, if you, if you want to kill this thing, um, it just boils down to preventing dollars and other currencies from flowing out of the platform. And you do that by by regulating the hell out of the exchanges, because and rightfully so, right, they, they fall outside of the pre existing law. Um, we've talked about so much, Joe, uh, I feel like I've learned a lot. Yeah. Can I show you one thing, though? Yeah, um, yeah. Let's, I, let's talk about out. let's talk about other th stuff within the uh, within both suits that are relevant. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to point out this one section, which I think is really, uh, it's the heart of their allegations. Okay, so I'm reading, this is the petition for the temporary restraining order. This is page 35 of, of 76, if anyone wants to read it. Um, but this is the real section that it, it forms the meat of the, of the argument for why a TRO should be granted now. And they basically say that, crucially, BAM Trading admits that CZ and Binance continue to possess substantial control over BAM Trading's crypto assets. And they talk about how the BAM Trading account with AWS holds customer unstaked assets is associated with Binance, um, that their, their security encryption for the, the US platform involves the key shards, four of which are required, and that effectively some of the shards are controlled by CZ. They talk about, they go all the way to June 2nd, right? June, from May to June 2nd, 2023, just a few days ago, BAM Trading reported 404 transfers of crypto assets using the key shards, and at least 45% of these transfers included approvals by Binance executives. That's the international executives. I mean, they've got a lot here, right? That Binance continues to main control, maintain control of the Binance US platform assets, staked crypto assets. They're held in wallets in the United States that have four shards only two of which are required to approve transfers, Binance continues to hold two key shards, thereby giving Binance control without the need to involve BAM trading employees. Man, I mean, that's big, right? Like that basically says, what is what is the real distinction between these two entities? Um, how, how are they in effect separate and distinct? They're not. It's just one big pot of money, one big you know source of control, and uh, you shouldn't treat them any differently. You basically had the, the international, by virtue of the BAM, BAM trade and the U.S. entity, directly interacting with U.S. customers' money and treating it like a piggy bank. Um, so this is this is significant. I mean, I, I was listening to some uh, Twitter spaces where people say, "Well, they don't have any evidence; they can't prove anything." Any of this. I mean, guys, look at this. I mean, they have they have document after document that they're citing extensively. They got reports. Um, I don't know how, how much more evidence they need to show the commingling of assets and commingling of control. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out because I think you can go through that document yourself and you could say, you know, at a minimum, I think it's clear that Binance has extensive control to this day over the Binance.com, the international has extensive control over the U.S. entity.
fantastic Joe for, for ages in the, in, in the fourth quarter, third and fourth quarter of last year, myself and others, I know Dylan caught fire for this. I caught fire for this. We were posting on chain evidence that there was commingling of user funds with some other entity. Um, you know, there was rehypothecation of user funds. There was just transfers of user funds off the platform to another wallet and transfers between Binance and Binance at us. And, um, clown clown for it extensively because where's your evidence where's your evidence um despite providing the on-chain data and now the sec has taken a look at the same evidence and as well as uh, you know insider uh reports to people who have come out um and they've confirmed as much they're they're just one big what you know all, all the funds under one big tent being commingled around um doesn't seem like the future of finance to me it, it just seems like uh <laughs> you know the, the same no. way the same way crony banks operate Absolutely. Well, I very much enjoy this. I have to get to a client that is, is, is actually texting me right now. So I'm going to have to cut it short here, but this is awesome. And I will just leave it with this. Okay. Before you wrap up, um, there is, this is anyone, right? There's a ton that's coming. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of fast moves in the Binance case. So this isn't going to be one where you read about it this week and then forget about it next week. There will be breaking news next week. Uh, if not on Tuesday, then shortly after that, and we'll see how the how things develop further. Um, but my guess is that you will see additional suits in the coming weeks that are filed. And I think you're going to see a, an order from the court that is going to uh, send uh, uh, ripples through the industry. No pun intended. No pun intended. Joe Carlosare, thank you so much for your time. You're a busy man going from court, working with a client. We, we truly appreciate it. I know the viewers do. You're the foremost expert on this within the space. Uh, the crossover that you have is, is just so perfect. Uh, and thank you so much for your due diligence that you've done before we sign off here and you head off to work with that client. Where can people find you? Uh, you can Google my name. I'll pop up very quickly um, as a partner on Amundsen Davis, where I'm co-chair of our cryptocurrency, fintech and blockchain practice group. Um, if you have any litigated disputes, I'd love to talk with you about them, uh, particularly commercial litigation on behalf of businesses, but also some individuals involved in the space. We represent a lot of miners. Uh, we look at a lot of regulatory issues for folks. So Happy to help. Um, reach out. You know, I also am available on Twitter at Joe Carlosari. DMs are open, uh, but uh, don't be offended if I don't respond immediately just because I get a ton of DMs about all sorts of things. But if you have a litigated dispute, um, I'm happy to help. And if I don't know the answer or I can't help you directly, I know a ton of people in the space that can. So feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, Joe. Everyone, have a great Thanks, day. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you later, Joe. Take, Take care. care. You too. Bye. The Bitcoin Layer is brought to you by Passport, a Bitcoin hardware wallet that you already know how to use. It has a gorgeous design, very sleek and form-fitting, fits right in the hand, has a directional pad, and frankly, you'll know how to use this the second you pick it up. Guys, if you've been putting off taking your Bitcoin off exchanges for any reason to this point, this is the device that you have to get. You can get it today at thebitcoinlayer.com slash foundation, and you can get an additional $10 off when you use code BitcoinLayer. Thanks so much for watching the video. We'll talk to you guys soon.